This new report examines the inclusion of smallholder farmers in modern value chains. And that means simply when small scale farmers in places like Africa, Latin America, Asia, who are producing very small quantities are linked to these global networks of production, um, often through big corporate brands and, and corporations, uh, but also through supermarket chains. So this gives smallholders the opportunity to access these, what they're called highly lucrative markets where they can sell their products and they can, in theory, receive a lot of benefits from doing so. And what this report does is we're in a way putting the microphone to people working in that sector and asking them, well, is that all true? Is that all the case? Has it delivered these types of benefits? And what we're hearing in this report and what we and what we write in the report is there's there's lots of rumblings and there's lots of concerns and questions from people within the sector about the effectiveness of these linkages uh, between smallholders and these global value chains. So so it prompts this, this report prompts a host of new questions about whether this has been the right tool for the right problem. This is an essential question of development for many years is how do you develop rural areas? In, so, so poverty, low productivity, access to technologies, this has been a perennial problem of development. How do you modernize and bring markets and how do you bring development into rural areas? And from about 20 years or so, the solution has been, well, to do that, farmers are stuck in this low productivity, low yielding, uh, low income cycles of producing very basic food staples. So if only we were able to link them to highly profitable markets, that would change the game. That's the theory. And that is why it was pushed. The idea was, if the farmer is able to sell instead of to the local regional wholesale market, if they sell to Tesco or if they sell to Unilever, then they might get a much bigger, a much better price and a better slice of the of the profits. And what I see is interesting about this is that to do that is difficult. And so so farmers need help to do it because, because complying with the standards of these big networks is difficult. So the whole inclusion problem program is about supporting farmers to be able to, to do that effectively. What we found is that basically there's too many hopes and too many ambitions hinging on this, on this issue of smallholder inclusion. So yes, farmers are selling into this market. Some of them are certainly but it hasn't really brought all the benefits that it was supposed to bring, higher profits, um, income, jobs, investment. Some, there have been some, some benefits to some farmers, but mostly to farmers that were already rich or were already better off. It hasn't really brought big benefits to, to the poor farmers. And there were also ambitions and expectations that this was going to be a game changer in terms of women empowerment. But we also haven't seen that. We've seen that 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 women and, and gender inequality is really, really persistent, even when farmers build uh, sell into these markets. And the other thing that was hoped for was it would that is that it would have big environmental benefits that by linking to these modern, sophisticated markets. Um, environmental degradation could be reversed, farmers could produce in more, in more sustainable ways, and we actually haven't seen a lot of progress in that area either. So, so it's incomes, it's gender, it's environment, where the, the ambitions were high and, and the delivery seems to, to, to be well short of what was expected. What we found is that this topic is moving in a really interesting direction, which is the industry and the sector insiders realize everything I just said. They know they, they, they themselves have prompted these questions. And so what is interesting is to see where they're looking at for, for signposts, for, for where to invest and how, where to go next. And the big one that we see is actually the recognition that it's local, informal, 
domestic food markets that might be the solution and that might be the answer. So rather than having to sell to the Tesco's or the Unilever's, as I said, the, it might be that selling to a neighbor, selling in their local market, actually is a more profitable endeavor that it presents perhaps less hassle for farmers. They get paid in cash. They can sell all sorts of qualities without having to worry too much about standards. And, and they get paid quickly. So, so, so the appeal of these, of these global chains, I think, is, is, is being lost a bit. Um, and it's really these this informal markets where, where, where the action seems to be. But the trick a bit, and where I think investors and donors might be wanting some guidance is they don't have a lot of experience working with this more informal side of the equation. Obviously, it's easier to work through a big business like Unilever than it is to work through the more messy uh, intermediaries, wholesalers of traditional markets. But I think what with the right tools, I think investment in this, in this what is often called the hidden part of the supply chain uh, can, can provide a real effective way of, of helping farmers and, and by the way, helping a, a whole lot of other people who are involved in food, in food trade.